When I first met Michael Ormiston, I met him as a teacher. However, in time, I discovered he was much more than that. He's a performer, a multi-instrumentalist, an experimentalist, a sound transformer, a friend. I've been involved in uh, Khumi, uh, Mongolian overtone singing, since I first heard it in 1988, in August. Um, I went to check out some Mongolian music and dance, because uh, I knew nothing about it, and I was really into what was just then becoming world music, uh, and I used to buy and go to loads of concerts. And so I checked it out, and it really, uh, when I heard this man sing some Khumi, it did, it did two things. It sort of went to me and it sort of resonated me sort of here. Uh, and then there was, what's he doing? It was like very strange. And I, you know, I play uh, lots of stringed instruments and so I understood what harmonics were, but I had no idea that you could sing it with the voice. So I uh, got totally inspired. There's a lot of processes involved. The first process was hearing it, being inspired. That's the process, hearing it and being inspired. Mm -hmm. And I've met people who've learnt versions of overtone singing just by doing that. Uh, so I would go, I used to um, strum my guitar on E for hours, uh, just going, and then I, when I went to the Song of Harmonics um, uh, film, which would be in 1989, uh, oh, I can put the tongue in my mouth, oh, what, no control, but at least I can hear a few harmonics and stuff, so I was teaching myself. I went to uh, a workshop, uh, um, a woman who's been involved a lot with overtone singing and, and therapeutic sounds, a woman called Jewel Purse, and so, because I, I was searching out everything uh, in England, and that was the only thing, so I went to a workshop, she uh, talked a lot, but didn't really teach me much. Uh, she does a very Western type of, of style of, 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 of singing, which I'll, I'll, I'll sort of explain. It's more, more of just doing vowels. A little bit higher for her, which is different to uh, a Mongolian singing. You can, quite, you can hear it if you go to her, her workshop. Uh, that helped me a lot in developing my voice, in actual fact, and thinking about how the voice is so much connected with uh, our body and our breath. Uh, so I knew about the technique with the tongue, um, but the thing that I was really taught uh, in, in Mongolia uh, by Serendawa in the western Mongolia and um, Gerrit Salt, and also Sengadorj as well, he was, was to sound more Mongolian in the sense of the basic sound. Uh, and that was quite hard because it was done by imitation. So um, we would be in the round felt tents and Serendava didn't know much English, but he look at the Mongolian lesson one, here we go. And lesson one was basically trying to get this guttural sound. So instead of sort of um, going, eh, he'll go, eh, oh, ah, and he'll do all these things and he'll push you a little bit and say, so got my head like this and you go, what am I doing? And then his ex exercise, yeah, and I was going, because <laughs> it's like really difficult. Uh, uh, they don't teach it as such. Uh, basically, uh, they might advise you. Uh, there is, the, the, that is different, but in Chandaman Sum in the Western Mongolia where it's very strong, the way they do it is a kid would just try and do it. They then might go to their dad, their uncle, their granddad, or even to Serendava or a respected singer and try and learn a little bit more.
Okay, so there's a number of different styles, but uh, the basic style that which I was taught was called uh, Taganine Humi, which means palatal Humi. So that uses uh, the tongue on the hard palate. Uh, the, roughly the flattened tip of the tongue stays in one place, while the middle of the tongue and the back of the tongue just moves up and down. Um, so there's a physical uh, movement. So to, to do that, um, uh, you could just sing that uh, without, first of all, uh, the more Mongolian uh, guttural sound. Shahultai uh, comes from the word to press or to squeeze, uh, and that needs a lot of support. So, uh, uh, what you really need to do is have very strong muscles in your abdomen and the smaller back, to, and a very open. You need a very open chest. Uh, you need a very open, uh, very well supported uh, throat, uh, open where your uh, larynx is. It needs a lot of resonance. Serendabra says um, basically you need good throat um, strength or good throat lining strength. Uh, really opens up the, the throat. Then you need to have this very little kink. Uh, uh, when you do an E, e that actually tightens up uh, at your uh, uh, pharynx just a little bit, a bit like an hourglass. Uh, and that then creates this compressed shahaltai sound. <coughs> Ooh, then you use exactly the same technique. Uh, and that uses a lot of physical strength. Serendavra has said you need to be, to be a good humi singer, you've got to be a bit like a sports person.
Some say that behind every great man there is a great woman. Yet Candida is right by Michael's side. I've been working with Michael Ormiston since 1999, uh, when I first met him actually, and uh, I was inspired by his music uh, to take on and learn the art of Humi singing. Uh, I've been doing overtone singing with a man called Roland Rochelle uh, previously and had trained in sound healing therapy and really wanted to sort of explore my voice using harmonics and um, Michael seemed the perfect person to sort of get in contact with at that time and uh, I started having lessons with him in 1999. <laughs> I have been practicing for the last four or five years to sing this undertone style and um, it's just something I felt that I needed to do in my voice. So the thing you can do with it is uh, sing words. Um, so I'll just do a, an improvisational word, maybe real words. Um, the idea is to try and create uh, some vowels that change obviously the harmonics um, so you actually hear more clear harmonics coming through from the up uh, from the undertones.
together I <laughs> well it it's become quite natural hasn't it we uh, we live together and we're partners so we're just you know we we, we sort of know each other quite well so it's uh, it's quite easy in some ways to play it's the most natural thing to then play together yeah, to become a challenge and yeah. so you know there's meant to be the old adage you should never have uh, before but yeah. never <coughs> have a professional relationship and a personal relationship but we do, and it can't work. Uh, it just has its ups and downs. Like, that's a normal thing in life. Yeah. Uh, and so it's great. To me, it brings me miles closer to Canada. Fantastic. Everything is a ritual. If you decide it to be a ritual, opening the door can be a ritual. I think if I'm doing a concert and I put on uh, a, a different clothing, that's very ritualistic. Uh, it's a form of focusing uh, your, on this event. Some people say it's just a costume, so it depends on where. I think depending on what I'm doing as well, like the concert that you saw us with the uh, gongs is on the line of a, like a therapeutic sound transformational event. Uh, and there, I think it's great just to um, help the situation. It doesn't have to be being very grave, but it's just focus and intent. And
healing journey. So it's exploring different ways of sound, whether with a voice, with an instrument, with drums, with flutes, singing Tibetan singing bowls and gongs. And um, yeah, it's just the, it, the, you know it's just vibration that people can really move into and uh, explore in themselves how how they feel when they hear a certain sound and. Some people like to move, some people like to sit still. So it's, you know, it's open to interpretation. And I also, I don't know how you felt, but I could really feel different parts of my body resonating at different times with different sounds. So sometimes I would really feel it around the top of my head, other times I would feel it more in my throat. Or I could feel it, I could feel these, the vibrations working in my body. Like this. How do you feel now? Very uplifted, very relaxed. Sort of, I've been taken into a deep journey into myself. It's almost quite sort of like walking out into the London streets right now. I feel almost like I'll be floating along. This one here was in 2005, and it's with. Selendawa, who's my teacher, his son, and this is Batajo, who's another very good Humi singer, and his son. And this was at the 80th anniversary of their village, in communist type of terms. That's, that's when the power station got built. And uh, um, I was very fortunate uh, as well to be invited to sing there as well. You can see me with very short sure. hair. So that's a great privilege to be sort of uh, in this sort of um, culture. I'm never going to be in the culture, but to be accepted for what I do and for what I am. Uh, and this is so Serendava again. Um, and he, um, when he was a lad, he used to herd, and this is part of the Altai, the Jalgon Altai Mountains. And he used to herd, there's a little river that goes down here. And at winter time, they used to be up in this part. Uh, and he could hear the sound of the water and the wind. And this was one of his inspirations for Humi. Um, and there's lots of stories all, about that. And so he built uh, a little thing called an owo, uh, which is uh, a pile of stones, a cairn, uh, to thank the um, mountain, the spirit of the place, you could say, uh, for Humi. And we went up there, and he never actually showed that to me until in 2005. And um, he sang uh, some uh, Humi in his singing style, uh, with saying words uh, mm -hmm. and overtones, uh, as a little prayer. Uh, That's another also inspiring thing for me, which is uh, the landscape of Mongolia. I live in a city most of my life, and when you get to places like this, for me, it goes, whoa, the air mm. is fantastic. Um, this is the Jalgum Altai, and this is where, this is Chandamansum, so this is where Humi is. So it reminds me, I can visualise sometimes when I'm performing something like that. Um, <laughs> It actually transformed me. It might sound like it's the road to Damascus, St. Paul sort of thing, but it did wake me up. I was working in computing uh, and very unhappy in my life, um, earning lots of money relative to now. <laughs> but this thing, this type of singing, or was it this man, or whatever it was, got things going for me and uh, I had to, I went bought the cassette uh, of the uh, of the concert, uh, went back home, what am I doing, don't know, uh, and then I started trying to find out about it and it went on from there until now. 